the thing that will kill a deal the most quickly is the numbers going what are called soft. And I came off the call and um, I said it was fiery. And I smashed up my keyboard and everyone in the office went quiet, definitely quiet. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this, but you could end up with a team of people who just want to come in and do a nine to five. I'm on the move. Welcome to this bank holiday special, episode 78 of Agency Phonics, where myself, Ryan O'Keefe from Jago, is taken over the show as the host. And my guest is the wonderful founder of this thing called Peter Hall. Before we get on to Peter, I'd like to thank the sponsors, Sante. They offer health and well-being services to all those in the community. I'd also like to thank the staff behind Agency Nomics and Cactus for working really hard to make all of this happen. Today, I'm going to find out a little bit more about Pete Hall and the correlation between emotional intelligence and what makes a business owner successful. So without further ado, let's meet the man himself, founder of Agency Nomics, uh, author of Agency Nomics and founder of Agency Phonics, and also founder of m and an advisory consultancy, Cactus. Pete, welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Ryan. Like, great intro. Thank you very much. Uh, what a delight to be in your garden today. Oh, I'm loving it, actually. And it's nice to have you in that chair and me sitting in this chair. It makes a nice change. Okay. And um, let's hope this weather holds off. Amazing. Well, it's looking okay at the moment. Brilliant. Well, thanks for having us. Let's get into it. Look, the theme today is obviously emotional intelligence and what part that plays in becoming a successful business leader or business owner. Um, before we get into that, it'd be good to know a little bit about your backstory and how you've arrived at the place you are today. today. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think like a lot of people in business, it's not always a direct route to where you arrived to. Um, from my perspective, I mean, I've always been good with numbers, but when I left school and college, there was, if you just said to me, you're going to be an accountant in 10, 15 years' time, I would have laughed. Well, this is not, it's not going to happen. Um, I went into retail management and um, worked for John Lewis Group after I left Sixth Form College. I uh, studied business. Cause I've always been interested in business, which is part of the reason why I ended up where I am today. Um, but I had a period of ill health and ended up having to leave that role and I uh, was advised to get a desk job at the time and um, some of you may realize that Mark Probert who works for Cactus also an accountant good friend of mine was having a drink with him one night saying I've got to have a bit of a change of career here he said come and be an accountant and I said no we've been drinking too much of your homebrew my friend we're not gonna <laughs> we're not going down that route anyway so um, four weeks later I got the job so trained as an accountant, was doing tax returns, year ends, VAT, audits, all that kind of thing. Worked for a couple of big firms, ended up at uh, Smith & Williamson, who were a top 10 accounting firm. Um, but I think along that journey, I'd obviously picked up a lot about business and finance, which was really, really useful. And obviously spent a lot of time auditing, which is going out and meeting clients and having to build relationships with FDs and finance staff. But what really interested me about accounting was actually the business side of it so I wanted to get into a business and become an accountant or an FD for a company and work at one place and try and help grow grow that business the, the, the book that aspired me in terms of uh, business was um, Richard Branson's autobiography when it first came out I think it's called losing my virginity okay. so it was a great book really inspiring whether you like Richard Branson or not but a great a great story and that inspired me to go and find a role in in a business which happened to be an agency where I met my business partner, Spencer Gallagher. I became the accountant for Blue Halo, the agency, um, which was probably about 12 staff, 750,000 turnover. And the brief from Spencer was, I can't really afford you, <laughs> so you've got to pay for yourself. So luckily I had a few um, tips and tricks up my sleeve, which helped with, helped with business cash flow. And Spencer and I grew the business together ultimately to an exit. I became a group CFO for the, the company that acquired us. And the, the short version is Spencer and I left that business and fell into consulting after a number of our business friends and contacts 
you know, spoke to us and said, look, we, we need we need help. Um, there aren't advisors out there who, who you know specifically have gone through the journey that you've gone through in that type of business. Will you come and help us? So before we knew where we were, we had a consulting business. That naturally led on to sitting on boards of agencies where they're thinking about growth. And part of growth uh, for any business is to consider M&A, mergers mm. and acquisitions. Do we acquire another business? What are we doing? Are we growing the business to, to, to sell or to last? And um, for a lot of those people, it was time to grow to sell. So we'd been an M&A firm, I think, in what I would call stealth for a few years, mm. doing M&A, um, buying and selling uh, agencies on behalf of clients. And about two years ago, we decided to more formalise that offering and you know start hiring a team around that and, and take it from there. So that's the kind of short version of how we got here today. Incredible, really, really uh, fantastic to hear about your success. I know for one personally, when working with many accountants that bored me, haven't really managed to engage me, you're the one that stands out that have made numbers fun. Yeah. And you, you managed to simplify the message for me. And, and for me as an entrepreneur, what I need to know is the implication of what the numbers mean. Yeah. And to have that communicated to me in a way that is, um, yeah, in, engaging. And so you do that in a way that I think resonates and I'm not surprised that you're uh, successful at what you're doing at the moment. Well, there's a few things in there that you said that I'd like to touch upon. The first thing is simplification. Yeah. I think a lot of, um, I'm going to say business owners, not necessarily agency owners, but lots of business owners I've come across over the years have think they have to have the most complex systems and processes to be able to run their business and grow it. And the reality is I probably run my business and my client's business off about four documents. Three of them are spreadsheets. So it doesn't really have to be any more complicated than that. The second thing to say really is that over the years I've met a lot of different personality types in terms of business owners. Some of them like complex data and they prefer seeing you know, of an old-fashioned profit and loss account, balance sheet, cash flows. And other people, particularly in the agency world, much more creative, more visual learners, prefer seeing data presented in a, in a way that is a little bit more understandable, less formal. So for me, I have to work with those people, understand what they, what they need, and then empathise with them and say, if I was sat in that person's shoes there, this is a, a person that was a creative director, now runs an agency, has openly told me in a you know in the in the in the kind of sales process with us that they were dyslexic and they'd had accountants before that had baffled them. I had to take that on board and understand that when I'm helping them understand their data, that it needs to be presented in a certain way. Otherwise, I'm not going to be successful in what I'm trying to do. And what I wouldn't want to do is work with someone for that period of time. And I've got a lesson here actually. It was just a stories come to mind where I remember working for an agency owner for probably six seven months. And uh, at the end of a board meeting, he just touched me on the leg. He said, he said, look, I really value what you do. And you've added loads of value to, to all our finance stuff. He said, but some of the things you talk about, I just don't know what they mean. And I often don't use acronyms. I, I wouldn't say dumb things down. That's an unfair way of putting it. But I try and keep things as simple as possible. So I'd never realized. And this guy was just too embarrassed to, to tell me. I said, that's cool. So next time we had a meeting, I put together a deck of all of the agency terms and just went through it, walked by it, through it one by one. And um, ultimately, we had much better meetings, had a better grip on the finances after that, that, that conversation. So that was just keeping it simple, understanding, using empathy there to, to understand what that person would, would want to see and um, get the most value from. Love that. Yeah, you're using your EQ to read the room, right? Understanding how to meet. Well, it your... taught me a, a big lesson that because the the coming from a practice background is where accountants work in practice for clients yeah. the assumption is there that the business owners work with lots of clients over the years will have had lots of meetings with accountants and just understands this stuff because they run a business the reality is of course is that that is not the case mm. so that was a big lesson for me it was a, it was a while ago it was eight nine years ago but it stuck with me yeah um so every time i'm working with people now i kind of make the point you know how do you want to see the data if you asked an accountant to put your month end together they would do certain things to tick certain boxes sure but equally there are products out there now that can display the data in a in a way that you can understand it more easily yeah love that and that's that's the difference isn't it as an accountant that's got self-awareness that can learn from those situations yeah and be able to adapt to your audience i yeah. think that's what makes you who you are right and that's that's key and i think 
I used to avoid accountants, especially in a sales role that I was, because I always used to think they would, you know, uh, be negative in terms of their clients spending more money. But I think with you, not saying you advise people to spend more money, but you've got a growth mindset as an FD yeah. and as an accountant, um, rather than just crunching the numbers and seeing how people can save money. I think entrepreneurs need that advice on good stewardship of yep. accounts and money and cash, but also how you're going to take it to that next level. The way that I would describe it is that I spend 90% of my time looking forward and 10% looking back. Yeah. I'm trying to get my clients to a place where they kind of know what their numbers are going to be for the month. And the month end process is a, did we get where we thought we'd be? Yes or no? Yeah. Most of the time it's yes. Sometimes it's a bit of analysis to do if it's no, but we're always looking forward. What are the sales for the next 90 days? What's revenue? What's gross profit? What's net profit? What does cash look like? How's the pipeline looking? How's the talent pipeline looking for the next 90 days? So it's not just about the numbers. Yeah. Um, but for me, that's the most important thing. And that is, you're right, it's a growth mindset. I'm always looking to see how I can grow an agency. I think, you're, I think it would be unfair to say that most or all accountants are looking at cost savings or tax savings. Um, but I think that's generally the stereotype. But as certainly I've been an accountant for 25 years this year, and actually seeing more and more people coming through now with a similar mindset to me. I don't know whether that's because when you go through the training, training perhaps the syllabus has changed now, or perhaps just business is changing. But certainly it's refreshing to see more when I mix with a lot of finance managers in the role that I work with, uh, sorry, in, in, in the role that I undertake and the people that I work with, and I'm seeing more and more of that now, more growth, more growth mindset in finance people, which is really, really refreshing. And the industry needs it. It's great. It's really reassuring as well that you're tried and tested. You've been there and done it. You've gone through growing a business. You've exited and helped many other agencies do that. I'd love to jump straight into EQ, emotional intelligence. For people who don't know what EQ is, it's emotional intelligence. What, what we see as EQ is around everyday behavior. It's around how to regulate your emotions and understand them more so that can guide your own thinking and behavior, both in a personal and professional capacity. So, P, when was your sort of first uh, intro to emotional intelligence and, and, you know, what do you think about it? Wow. Well, the phrase emotional intelligence, EQ, is actually something I've only come across more recently. I know that sounds a really odd thing to say, but I think we all go through life and realise that we have different skills and personality traits. And sometimes it isn't until someone tells you that if you if you bundle a few of those things together, it suggests, it, I wouldn't say it gives you a label, but it certainly suggests a you've got a strong emotional intelligence. And for me, I didn't really realise that until I went through the process with Jago where I was trying to look at my, my personal brand um, work. And part of that process was to understand a bit more about me. Mm -hmm. And for me, I went through that process. We did a lot of testing around my personality type and profile. And there were some surprises in there, in a, in a good way. Some things that gave me reassurance, and some things I was a bit like, yeah, that's definitely definitely me. But it was good to have that read back to me because it gave me confidence. You know, the things where I thought I was good at doing something, but um, as I said to you earlier when we were chatting before we sat down, I, in the role we were in, it's very uncommon to get a lot of praise and feedback for what you do. Because a lot of high pressure you know, um, meetings and work environments where it's quite stressful, you go in, do a job, and you know, I'm not going to say you get paid for it and then, and then you leave, but the expectation is there that you will achieve and be successful. So the fact that you do achieve and, and get clients successful is a kind of, it's just a given. For, so it's very unusual to receive feedback. So I never really had that much feedback. Okay. Um, I knew that I was probably okay at what I did because I got, used to get lots of referrals and, you know, you, you, you know, you know what, what's, what was the phrase? Uh, rep, is it reputation is what people say about you behind your back or something like that? Yeah. I knew that the good things were being said behind my back, but I never got those things to my face. So going through that process, it was good to, as good as a confidence builder, gave me lots of reassurance. But then obviously you came back and said, well, you've got quite high emotional intelligence levels. And I was like, well, I'm not going to go to Google. I'll just ask you, what, <laughs> what does that mean? And it was a lot of the, the skills that I'd learned over the years, coming from you know my background, a career to date, had culminated in you know the things that I do today in my role, because 
I didn't I didn't leave school and college to train to become a, a non-exec or M&A advisor. It's that's all experience and things that I've picked up over the years. So it was reassuring to um, to, to think that actually some of those skills that I'd acquired had funneled me to the right place. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think there's there's a couple of things while you're speaking. Is one we have a phrase at Jago that says you can't read the label from inside the jar. Yeah. And sometimes we need external people to give their honest opinion of what's actually happening. And, and with us, it wasn't actually an opinion. It was a scientific instrument that we used. Yep. The emotional intelligence assessment it wasn't a quiz. It's, it's something that people use in the health space for high profile um, yeah. prisoners to let them out. And now they've used it in the commercial space. But yeah, sometimes we need that, that validation and feedback from external people for us to believe it. Um, and I think, I think with your emotional intelligence, it was, it was obvious that your stress tolerance, your ability to cope with stress was, was standout, right? And so actually seeing what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, helping people grow their business, which is really stressful, right? Yeah. Especially in these turbulent times that we found ourselves over the last few years. Um, there was no question that you were the right person for that role yeah and so it's it's that stuff that really links the information from the emotional intelligence assessment to our personal brand because actually what you're known for is let's call pete when we're in a you know yeah, in a predicament that. i mean i remember i remember calling you when actually one of our clients reached out to me to say lots of my accounts are cancelling on me and i wasn't you know the best place to give advice on that we do personal branding not how to manage finances and i said look you need to go and speak to pete hall and I remember speaking to you and calling you up and you said, yeah, I'm happy to give that, that particular person some help. And so your reputation was in my mind at that point. Yep. And, and so I wasn't surprised when I saw that data being fed out from the emotional intelligence results to say yeah. your stress tolerance, your ability to cope with stress was one of the highest that I've ever seen. Um, but also you're an optimist because you've seen it. You've been there and done it and it you've seen it. comes through the other side. That's where the optimism comes from. And that's great. And we all need that. So it's that reassurance, that ability to bring the calm in the storm, as well as then shine a light on the future, an optimistic future, brighter yeah. days around the corner. So, yeah, I think it's amazing how the EQ brings that clarity that you're talking about uh, and that confidence to say, this is actually who I am. Yeah. Even though I might have felt it for years, this is validated what my heart and, and intuition knows that I am. And, and, and by having that knowledge, you can then be consistent with turning up consistently yeah. with, with that essence. Well, the key thing was the calmness point because you know when um, you're in a meeting, you can't really see how you project and you've got the voice in, in your head. As I think those people that know me well actually know that I'm actually quite fiery sometimes. <laughs> I've got a bit of a temper and can be a bit moody sometimes but I always seem to outwardly project a calmness I seem to keep that other stuff inside so when it was read back to me that I am seen as, as calm and reassuring that was that was actually as I said before a good confidence builder because I don't know sometimes there's, there's a lot of you know thoughts going around in the head you're not quite sure how these things come out sometimes so the, the, I think the calmness thing is um it's definitely a personality trait I don't think it's something that um I've learned over the years I think um, the accounting training definitely steadied me because you have to follow set rules and regulations and processes to do that, which means that sometimes you can't jump in feet first. You've got to look at data, make a decision, and then go back with with um, solutions to to you know problems. Um, so yeah, so that was a particular interesting point. I think it's great, and I've seen a change. Right, I think once we all have that you know, that truth come out and it's validated. You know, I work with many leaders, successful leaders, financially successful, and we all have doubts and, and we all have gaps in our knowledge of who we are and what we stand for and what our positioning is and what our actual natural gifts and talents are. So when we can simplify those, those thoughts in our head and organize them and yep. be clear on what they are, then we can stop wasting time doubting ourselves or second guessing ourselves and we can get on with what we're really, really good at. And so, you know, that's, that's what we call purposeful living, right? That's, right, that's yeah. intentional. I know that this is the role I need to play 
and I don't have to question it, that anymore and I can start enjoying it. And yeah. I've, I've seen that in, in our clients and also you, you know. I completely agree. I mean, the best people that I work with know their strengths and weaknesses. They play to their strengths and they reinforce their weaknesses by either getting training or reading or listening to, to podcasts or actually most of the time just bringing in better people around them. You know, if yeah. it, it, it's no great shame to admit you're not good at something. That's it. I had this in the past when I worked at Blue Halo. I was crap at credit control okay. because um, chasing money just used to piss me off. I think, <laughs> why haven't people paid? You used to annoy me. Yeah. And it was only after I had a particularly stressful call with a client who I knew was giving me the runaround. And I came off the call and um, I said I was fiery. I smashed up my keyboard on the desk and everyone in the office went quiet, deathly quiet. Like, Pete's had a bit of a turn here. And... Um, Vim, who you know, um, MD at Giant now, has worked with me at Blue Halo, came over and touched me on the shoulder and said, are you OK? I said, no, I've lost my J. <laughs> but from, from that day on, I was thinking, I just need to bring in someone to do the credit control yeah. stuff because I'm not good at it. And, it. and I use that story to highlight why I think good business leaders say, I'm not good at finance, I'm not good at marketing, I'm not good at new business, I'm not good at delivery, and bring experts in around them to help them just recognizing that rather than stressfully carrying on with something and you know you're doing something you know you're either not good at you don't enjoy it just creates more stress yeah. and you know part of the role that i'm trying to do with my clients is trying to take some of that stress away and soak it up yeah you know help share the problem let's try and solve it together and then come up with some solutions and actually focus on on what you're good at yeah i love that find the habitat to thrive right yeah and it takes some time sometimes to find that habitat yeah. that we can thrive within yeah. you know whether that's in business or building your personal brand we try lots of different things um and at some point we say actually that's where i can thrive the most that's when i can get into my flow the most and actually we can enjoy our lives a lot better because of that I touch, you touched on sort of some of the work you do with agencies i, I want to explore that a little bit more what do you think agency uh, agency owners need obviously you know EQ we're talking about emotional intelligence what part do you think EQ and emotional intelligence plays in being a successful business owner agency leader agency owner that's a great question I think I'm going to start with a specific example that I use in our business which is um, uh, bizarrely for a CFO <laughs> background I help run our office vibe um, which keeps a finger on the company culture. We've got 15 people in our team now, and some of you listening may have heard of Office Vibe. It kind of surveys the team regularly to find out where the, the, the you know, the ENPS is, how the culture, how that's um, holding up in in the business, and the the employees get the chance to feedback. They get asked questions, and I take the time to number one read the feedback properly not get emotional about it. It's the employee's opportunity. It's anonymous or it's not anonymous. They can put their name to it. Then I think, well, actually, it wasn't that long ago when I was an employee. Spent half of my career so far today as an employee. I've only been self-employed for the other half of it. So that point of empathy, okay, well, I can see that person's point of view. And then responding in a way that, you know, is is constructive and, and fair. So for me, I think it's that's a lot of empathy there. That's the first thing, you know, is... Um, People, if you want people to understand how you feel, I think you've got to understand how they feel. Mm. I think, you know, I think it would be fair to say that a lot of team members, if they are watching this, probably have no idea the, the stress and strains that an agency owner has to go through in terms of all the pressure of targets and numbers on them and the hiring and firing decisions. But equally, I think sometimes, not just agency owners, all business owners can be guilty of not really sitting in the shoe of the, the team member and understanding yeah. There's, so I think empathy is a, a big one. Self-awareness is another one as well. I think, um, you know, if I'm talking about the two big numbers in the P&L, if I go here from an accounting perspective, we talked about the people cost, but think about your income. You know, being self-aware when you're in, you know, client meetings or new business meetings, you know, being able to read a room. Mm. You know, em again, empathy, you know, um, empathising with the client or the prospect about their particular situation, what they're trying to achieve, and relaying that back to them. And I think also being adaptable as well. I think you've got to, you know, for me, I think one of my skills over the years in terms of dealing with clients has been the ability to adapt to different people. You know, there are some people who are very, they want the professional, you know, turn up, blazer, 
shirt, tie, that kind of thing. I can do that. Equally, if someone said to me, let's meet, meet down the pub, have a couple of pints and go through the p and and wear a T-shirt and shorts, I can do that too. So it's just trying to find a way to, you know, understand, you know, your, your team members, you know, your, your clients more. I think that's something that everybody would find useful, you yeah. know, learning how to, to do that or, or if you've got those skills, honing them a bit more. Yeah, love that. I think having a group of people that are self-aware and have the ability, one, to check in with themselves before they yep. interact with each other, but also you're talking about empathy there, actually putting yourself in the other person's shoes builds for a really, really strong culture. Yep. And when you're all looking out for each other, that's a really special place to be as a business, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I see a lot of businesses investing in, in, in development, leadership development, people development. I don't see too much on emotional intelligence just yet. I know it's been talked about as a soft skill, especially with all these uh, stories around AI coming out and taking people's jobs, but it, you know, how, is it, how are we gonna be more human? A lot of people talk about DISC, with the personality profiling. Yeah. What, what's your experience? What people are using? Are they using DISC? Because I've got, I've got some views and opinions on yeah, the differences between some EQ people, and DISC. Yeah, some people do use it. I mean, it's good to understand your team at a very high level in terms of kind of the different strands that they sit in, yeah. whether they'll gel with other team members or not, whether they'll sit right in one particular team or another. And also when you go through an interview process, it's quite a useful tool. Um, 16 personalities is another good one as well. Yeah. I think it's um, quite interesting at least three or four people in Cactus have similar 16 personality profiles. There's three or four of us that are defenders, me, my daughter, Abby, I think is a defender as well. Um, so you can see that birds of a feather do kind of <laughs> flock together yeah. to some extent. Um, but I think that going a bit deeper and you know going looking at real... EQ levels is probably something that's not the norm, I would say. Yeah. I would say in professional firms, I think lawyers, accountants, consultants, etc., you know, finance in particular, I think moving forward, it's going to become more important because I think as people move through the business, you know, I was quite senior in the accounting firm that I worked for at a very young age, not because I was the best accountant is because I had the people skills to work with the clients to get results. Okay. They were better accountants than me in the office, certainly from a tax perspective. But some of those people, you know, no slight on them at all, but didn't quite have the people skills to go and have the conversation. So if you've got bright stars coming through the organisation, you can spot certain areas where actually it would be useful for them to understand a bit more about themselves and work on that. Uh, that's a, a great way to, to, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a bit of a counterpunch to the the personality quizzes and especially DISC. I, I've been privy to both, right? I've worked in the, yeah. the commercial space before setting up my business and we've done the insights. So they would say, well, if it's a red, you spot someone's a red, make sure you turn up like a red and just give the high detail, be quite bullish, don't go into the numbers too much, don't, don't be too fluffy. Uh, and that's great. And I see that as kind of first level self-awareness. So if I know that you're blue, you know, my interaction with you, let's talk about sales capacity here or negotiations would be very detailed, right? Yep. So that's really cool. So I call, I call that first level self-awareness. The reason why I'm such an advocate for emotional intelligence is because that's about everyday behavior. So for instance, I'll give you a simple example. If I'm going into a sales meeting as an agency owner or a pitch, and I've just had a full on argument with my wife and I feel really um, off balance, if I take that emotion into that meeting, then that will impact that interaction. Absolutely. It doesn't matter whether they're a red, a blue, a yellow or a green, it doesn't matter yep. because I'm not effective in that meeting. But with EQ, because it's about everyday behavior and regulating your emotions to strike a balance that's gonna serve you, I can adjust myself before stepping in. I can adjust and regulate and understand that actually I'm not gonna feel like this all day. Yeah. I'm gonna sort that that issue out later. I don't need to bring this baggage, this emotional baggage into the meeting with me. Well, that's the self-awareness, isn't it? It's the self-awareness. Yep. And get back to that, that level that I know that serves me so well. And actually, more importantly, show up to that interaction because what I know through being successful in sales predominantly and in business is the way you show up to any interaction is usually the determining factor of that relationship. 
Yeah, so if you can turn up more consistently, then you're going to have more positive outcomes in business. Yeah. Because people trust you when you turn up consistently. So, yeah, this is why. And also on, on, the, on the point of DISC, that's almost encouraging people to mirror that particular color insight. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in that so much. And I'm also not interested in people flocking together. Although I think that happens naturally and it's a human default yeah. to be attracted to people that do feel like us. But I'm also interested in the ability to interact with many different people, even if they're completely different to me through that self-awareness and that empathy that you spoke about earlier to understand that actually if I'm slightly extroverted, I can interact with an introvert because I can give them space yep. and time and make them feel comfortable. And I think that's when you can be really effective without having to necessarily mirror a certain color insight or to just connect with people that may look and sound like you. Yeah, I think from the perspective of flocking together, I think I can give you two perspectives on it there. I think from our perspective, you know, growing from, I don't say, say four to eight people, it was a case of, oh, well, they're, they're quite similar. We get on. <clears throat> um, that works pretty well for us. But I think actually now we've taken it a little bit more scientifically. Um, and it's now a case of, okay, well, there's different um, parts to the team. There's, you know, people who work in new business, people who work in marketing, people who work in service delivery, finance. Some people have a foot in all camps in our business. And it's finding out, you know, for specific candidates coming in, where they would sit against the other people in the business. So it's not necessarily about finding the, 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 the people that are the same. It's the complementary skills and um, personality traits that are important. Yeah, I love that. It's the complementary, right? You need to have the right people in the I room think, that yeah. bring something different to the table. Absolutely. I was just saying about on the point of diversity, I think this is why a lot of businesses now, it's, it's not a bandwagon that's being jumped on, in my opinion. I think it's people recognising that actually... And let me take a stereotyped example. Let's say you're a big investment bank and for the last 250 years, all of your chairmen uh, have come from Harrow or Eton. Yeah. Then the business is never going to change. Wouldn't it be interesting to hire from more diverse backgrounds and get a few more different perspectives on life into yeah. the business? So I think a lot of people are taking that approach now. Yeah, I think it's great. I think diversity of thought, of backgrounds, of stories can only add value to anyone's life and business. Yeah, absolutely. Let's um let's let's go into the leadership stuff. We talked about agency owners. Do you think from your experience of working with many successful agencies, I mean you must have worked with thousands of agencies, the ones that are the the top of their game, do you think they have emotional intelligence? Is there is there a trend between your really successful agencies, not just in terms of financial position, but also just culture? You know, what I think oh, I haven't looked. I haven't actually considered that okay. point until you've asked it right then. So that's me going. To the cogs were worrying sure. in the mind, but I think they absolutely must must have good EQ levels because I think you gave the point about going into the, having the, the the row with the wife and checking yourself before you go into the meeting. Imagine being a successful agency owner and having hundreds of interactions with different people every day your team, your clients, your suppliers, freelancers coming in. Um, I mean, things like this from a, you know, a awareness perspective. You've got to be able to, to, to do that check 100 times a day. So if you didn't have the EQ levels, you wouldn't. You would just be something would, excuse the turn of phrase, piss you off in the morning, and you would just carry that through the day with you, and you just piss everybody off. Then you'd have, you know, higher staff turnover, You'd have lower EMPS scores, culture, morale would be down in the business, people wouldn't stay. You wouldn't be able to retain clients. You wouldn't be able to attract new business as well. So if you then flip that on its head and say, well, you know, you're a business leader who's grown a business successfully, you know, harnessing the strengths you've got of EQ, then you're going to have better staff retention, better morale, culture. You're going to hire the right people with the right mindset. You're going to keep your clients and you're going to get more clients. So all of those things are very simply the recipe to success, I would say. Yeah. So basically you're saying more EQ, right? Invest, <laughs> invest in your EQ to oh, become yeah. successful. You're talking about self-awareness and yeah. that ability to check, check in with yourself to, to advance, right? 
hundred percent. I mean, it's sometimes it's not even about uh, advancing. I think it's about not going backwards. Okay. Sometimes, so you know, for me, for you know, I had, as I said to you, I'm quite introverted normally, and um, and I can become more extroverted when it's people I get to to know a bit better, and I let my I say let my guard down, but you know what I mean. I, yeah. You know, a bit more open with people. You know, you gave that great example earlier where you said, "I'm just about to walk into a pitch. I had a bit of a row with someone." And it's just you've got to check in with yourself a number of times a day to keep that stuff to the background because we're all going to have ups and downs in our lives every day. Um, and it's just how you how you deal with them, you know, and using your resilience to overcome those things. So if you're if you've got those, I think those three traits really: resilience, self awareness, and, and empathy. And I think you know, and um, I'm going to say you, you, you should be a great leader. I'm clearly there's more elements to the recipe than that, but I think those for me are the key ones. Yeah, I love that. And also I think having that level of self-awareness and empathy makes you really authentic Yeah. because you're prepared to lay it on the line, right? And actually let people know when you've messed up and cocked up. Yeah. And by the way, on the point of argument with my wife, I don't have many arguments, but... A day. Yeah, a day. <laughs> but I did actually have one last night. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Um, I was an idiot basically I spent the weekend painting my daughter's bedroom pink and I was a little tired and um, I was obviously set, setting myself up for a busy week and I had a little bit of a uh, fallout with my wife silly business but what I realized is I couldn't go to bed with the bad taste in my mouth I yeah. had to make amends with my wife before I went to bed to make sure I had a good start to the week so I managed to sort it out use my EQ got forgiveness from my wife which was amazing and actually had a good night's sleep that's good so it does show you that you know actually if you if you do mess up and we all mess up from time to time the quicker we recover that situation the better it is for everyone yeah it's like clearing the fog or the black cloud isn't it it's like look and you know i'll be honest i'm no better than the next person at dealing with these things but you know it's like you can something can happen and it does every day week month year and it's a case of saying well, we can let you can dwell on that and let it ruin your day or week or whatever or you can apologize or put something to the back of your mind reset yourself and i think that takes a lot of again self-awareness to be able to do that yeah. um i just what you're i'm just laughing in the back of my head when you said about the not not going to bed on an argument basically the point i saw a meme on instagram the other day that, f that flashed up and it said uh it was a couple, and it said, we never go to bed in an argument. And then underneath, the husband was said, we've been asleep, awake for three days. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I think we have, actually, me and my wife. <laughs> yeah. With the young kids. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought about forwarding it to Lucy, but then I thought better of it. So it's, it's fantastic. And you're right. I think the more you have evidence of being able to sort the situation out, look yourself in the mirror... Dust yourself down. Know when you've been an idiot or you need to sort something out. Most of the time, out. it's on us, right? Yeah, I think, I think in relationships it can be. But in business especially, we need to really try to understand the full picture mm. in order to be effective at approaching that situation or those interactions in an effective way. And like you said, there's many, many challenges each day. So many different interactions, whether that's traffic, whether that's meeting someone in a restaurant or parking attendant or the first person we see walking through the door at the office you know there's so many different challenges we face to keep calm and cool and create that balance that actually you know with good eq we can have more effective days than bad days yeah and that's what we're all striving for yeah. we understand that happiness and well-being isn't something that can be 100 percent consistent all of the time but if we can be there more often mm. then we can be more effective we can be calm and considered yeah and i'm sure that that way, that then translates into better performance. Well, I know it does. Better performance in business. And again, that brings me on to, you know, your specific roles. I mean, you're a well-known FD for many different agencies, as well as your previous roles um, in businesses. You act as a non-exec. You help people grow, help them take them on those journeys, which can be a rocky road, especially over the last few years. Yep. As well as then take them through probably the most, one of the most defining moments in their life, which is to sell their bu business, their venture that they've been working on for many, many years. What part does, does EQ play in those roles? Well, it's absolutely uh, And can huge. you give us some examples? 
could probably, yeah, I could try and muster up a few uh, examples. I think the first thing you're right in saying, it's not just the last few years, it's just been rocky. Growing and running any business is difficult. Uh, I, don't, I think there are very few people in life who went into their late teens or college or university, come out of that and said, oh, I'm going to run a business one day. Sometimes you just fall into it. So you don't always have the skills. You've got to pick them up and, and learn them. And that takes patience as well. And the EQ stuff becomes really important because you need to recognise where you put the areas of strengths and weaknesses, as I've said before. I think, you know, you've then got to a point where you're growing your business and running it and you've got all the challenges. You know, you said about all the interactions every day just a minute ago. I mean, people have got WhatsApp, Slack, Messenger, email, all that stuff's going on, the phone's ringing, and it's trying to stay on, on that level. And then you get to a point where you think, okay, the, you know, it, and I like to think that when I'm having these conversations, people are thinking about selling their business because they're achieving their life's ambition um, and reckon, recognising the success they've had. Sometimes people have to sell for for other reasons, but taking the point where they're achieving their life's ambitions, they've grown the business and they're thinking, right, now I've got to now go, go through this process. A lot of people don't know what the process is. They've never done it before. Um, most people who sell a business, it will be the, f the first time that they do it and probably the only time that they do it. They've probably heard anecdotal stories from other people who've sold businesses. Oh, it's a nightmare, watch out for this. You'll get screwed over in the due diligence process. The lawyers will be arguing amongst themselves. X, Y, and Z. And so, so the biggest thing really is, you know, giving the people the reassurance that, you know, there's expertise on hand, someone to hold their hand through the process and have the empathy. You know, I've been through the process the other side as well. When our agency sold, I was the FD that, that managed that process. So, and I've been through the process on behalf of clients many times. So I know the process inside, inside out. Um, the biggest piece of advice I often give um, agency owners going through the process is business as usual at all costs because the process is, can be, well, it is stressful. You can't beat around the bush. There are going to be lots of questions, lots of meetings, um, lots of situations you'll find yourself in that you haven't been in before. But the business as usual point is the thing that will kill a deal the most quickly is the numbers going what are called soft during the process where people are trying to hit a figure that they've told the outside world that they're going to hit in terms of this is where our turnover and our profit's going to be <clears throat> and that's what the valuation is based on and they get so wrapped up in the process that they forget about looking after the clients and winning new business and making sure the team are okay so that's always the first thing for me is you know recognize that to achieve a successful sale, you need to continue to run a successful business at the same time. And then it's using your time wise, wisely and, and sparingly and working with the right advisors to to get through the process with as little distraction as possible. Uh, mm -hmm. There will be distraction, and that's why I'm saying as, as little as possible, because you you cannot help go through the process thinking, what if this happens? What if I lose this client during the process? What if this key person leaves you in the process what if I don't win in a new business there's going to be lots of what ifs and I deal with those things all the time and you know that some of the hardest roles I've had is where I am the non-exec on the board having the board meetings through the process but also involved in the M&A process as well so you have to keep them on track from a business as usual perspective even when there's perhaps fires going on left right and center and then two or three days later, you'll be having the meeting about the M&A stuff and they'll still be feeling a bit beaten up about something that's happened last week. And you have to say, look, it's, there's going to be ups and downs during the process. You just need to recognise that. You called me an optimist earlier. I think that's... Um, I, actually, I didn't call you an optimist. The data says you're an optimist. The data says I'm an optimist. Yeah, so, okay. so the data said you're an optimist. So I'm an optimist. <laughs> but, um, how I've always described myself is um, a, a realistic optimist. Yeah. So I'm always positive. But I'm always realistic as well. So the, pos the, po the, the optimistic side of me is saying, we will get through this. The realistic side of me says, but there will be bumps in the, in the road and we've just got to be prepared for them. Yeah. So we're going to get there, but it's not going to be easy. Yeah. So it's about setting the expectation and then you know, providing that reassurance that you're there to support people on the journey. Yeah, incredible. Uh, it is some journey and you need, as you said, you need the right people around you that must be paramount right and so people that can keep calm like you 
um, have that resilience to navigate. Yeah. Have the empathy that it takes to understand people's personal positions, their families are involved. You know, the turbulent time and the rocky road, as you say, to have that that calm voice yeah. of reassurance is is critical, right? And and you know, if, even for us, we work with with agencies, agency owners that are pre-sale. They say, actually, we want to build our personal brands and develop up us um, our emotional intelligence prior to sale because what we don't want to be is, you know, a person with a few million quid in the bank and, and not knowing yeah. what to do after that because it's a very emotional roller coaster. That's it. And so, and we've also got people that have already sold and they've come to us and say, well, actually, I don't know who I am. I, you know, all of my value was in the agency. And so suddenly they question their positioning. So, yeah. you know, actually EQ and understanding yourself authentically as a leader is, is critical I think during, you... post, pre, during and post any business transaction or sale yeah. because it's, it's life events. As I said earlier, it's, it's everyday behavior. Not saying that selling your agency is every day, but it is, it's personal as well as business. I think one of the things that people forget during the process if they're a business owner going for a sale is that this, the sale isn't the end. It's the, the kind of the end of a chapter and then they're moving on to another chapter. And for most people, when you look back at your life, your, your business lives, your careers, there are many chapters. I'm probably on about chapter five now out of ten. Um, but, you know, it, it might be I sold my agency was the end of chapter four. Chapter five might be the journey with the group. Um, chapter six might be well, what do I do? When I've completed my own out, do I stay on and with the, with the group, or do I go and do something else? So, the the people that you're working with are probably recognising the fact that they need to fine tune some of those skills for the next part of their journey, those next chapters. So that's something that probably cross crosses over to what, to what I do in this role is that it's not the end. You know, this is just yeah, you 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 might be selling the business, but you're going on to do something else afterwards. So, and that's the bit that people need reassurance on is the, the continuity so I try and get people to imagine what the the post transaction world would look like that's part of the the process that we go through the cactus which would be you know yes you'd like to exit and we've kind of got an idea of how the numbers will look but what does the ideal transaction look like for you what's the ideal business that you want to work with um, what sort of role do you want because actually a lot of the time the acquirers are looking for you to tell them that because they don't know. They just see the business, they see the numbers, think that'll be a great fit for our group or our business moving forward. But they often need to be guided by the people selling, the individuals, to say, well, actually, I see a role for myself here and this is something that I'd like to do. I've got um, an agency that's selling at the moment. We're about to uh, sign off the, the, the offer effectively and then move to the due diligence process where the agency founder on, on my advice has kind of mapped out what his career looked like and actually it ticked a lot of boxes from for the, the acquirer one of those things he said well i'd like to perhaps go traveling in in the u.s and do speaking gigs over there and build my profile and become well, well known and they said well that's great we we were just talking the other day about setting up a u.s office so that fits really well so that was a coincidence that those two things worked but if he hadn't have thought about what that next chapter looked like then that would probably be one less reason for them to make an offer, if that makes sense. Get it. So the million dollar question, specifically for agency owners at the moment, do we all have to sell our agency? Absolutely not. Okay. I think I think that's a common misconception about, um, certainly in my role over the years, where I think people always felt that, oh, you're working with Cactus, you must be looking to sell one day. For me, it's about getting to a place where you have a choice. And the choices are normally, yeah, you can sell if you get to a certain size or, or revenue or, or, or profit level. You can start buying other businesses. You can carry on running your business and have a good lifestyle. Um, or you can bring in someone else to run it and, and take a step back. But for me, it's about getting to a place where you have a choice about what you want to do. And the choice is determined by what is your number. So... You, someone might say, well, what's your number to retire? And I have a lot of people say somewhere between two and three million pounds. And I say, okay, we're working the numbers back from a 
knowing how agencies are valued, you need to get to this level of turnover and profit to achieve that number on exit as part of the transaction. So when they've achieved their number, then they know that's the, the, the point to, to press the button. Get it. Yeah, because I think there's a tendency to feel, especially as agency owners, feel like that that is the only route, is you've got to sell your agency to achieve you know, the golden yeah. dream, right? And, and I don't think you necessarily do, but as you said, it's the options. What's the number? What's, what does life look like? If you want to continue working and you're making enough money to do that, then great. But at some point, you might want some, uh, some, some space and some options to do different yeah. things. And part of the reason why I want people to understand what their business is worth is because I mentioned this earlier, where you imagine a situation where you sell your agency at the point you want to, but sometimes you might be forced to sell it through ill health or um, you know, taking care of a family member who's not well. And I've seen that recently where agency owners have come to us and said, I really need to sell, we've got ill parents that we need to go and look after and we need to, to sell this business. And they didn't know how much it's worth, didn't really know what they were aiming for. So for me, I think it's a case of even if you don't want to sell, I think it's a good eye, always a good idea to have a an idea of what it's worth okay. uh, roughly. I mean, it's like a house, isn't it? You might move into your dream home, forever home, but what's the greatest middle-class conversation in England? How much is your house worth at the moment? Everyone always seems to have an idea about how much their house is worth, but they never really have an idea about how much their business is worth. And for some people, a lot of people in business, they'll be surprised at how much their business is worth. They often don't know. Okay. I like that. Yeah, I think you need to keep an eye on the numbers. Yeah. Even if it's not something that you want to do straight away. Yeah. It's understanding what that looks like. Or whatever. And it's understanding what your options are. What are, you know, what are the alternative options to selling? So you can sell your business and make a yep. shed load of cash to set you up for retirement, give you the options that you you referenced earlier. What are the other options? Should should we be looking at selling as a priority? I know there are other options, but that should should that be a priority? Not necessarily as a priority. I might, I, I think growth is a priority. Okay. Um, and I say that because if you assume that you'll always lose some clients, if you're not winning new clients, then eventually you will die as a business. So there's a phrase out there that says, if you're not growing, you're dying, which sounds a bit harsh. But I think growing can be defined by many different things. You know, growing as a team and the skills that you've got and the client base that you've got in terms of your knowledge, uh, growing in terms of turnover, growing in terms of profit. So that, for me, is the most important thing. The alternatives to a sale are, well, you know, carry on drawing an income from the business, working in the business, acquiring other businesses and bolting on. But the thing to be aware of is at some point there's going to become a succession um, conversation that needs to happen. And I went to see an agency owner probably four or five years ago now at a very, very successful business. And he came to me and said, I'm 63. Um, I've got a problem with staff retention. Everyone keeps leaving. Um, I'm not really quite sure why that is, and it's impacting my numbers. Can you help me? So I went to see this person, and the first thing I said to him was, um, well, we've, we've undertaken a little bit of a review of why people are leaving, and it's because they've all said, you're 63, you're going to go soon. And there's no vision for the business, so they're off. It wasn't a lack of EQ then. Um, well, the other <laughs> thing, that, what then came out of this conversation was, wow, okay, I didn't really realise that. And, you know, the, the guy didn't realise it was in the kind of goldfish bowl and everybody's looking at him. And they'd all been there a while and he could see he was getting older, but there was never the conversation about handing the business over. Sure. So he kind of then valued the business, which he was a bit like, sounds a lot. It was a lot. It was eight figures. Okay. But his comment back to me was, I've earned more than that in dividends in the last 10 years. So I don't really need the money. So the route for him was, you know, then recruiting a new management team, selling the vision into them that they perhaps do an EOT, which is an employee ownership trust, where he'd sell the business to the employees in a tax efficient way. So that's another way of looking at it. But I think that particular person, rightly or wrongly, well, they'd had a very successful business and had a good income from it. So the last thing they needed was to draw the capital by selling it. That particular person, I think, had left it slightly too late to think about that. Well, what do I do? You know, I think that you know the right time is clearly always down to the individual. Yeah. Maybe I've read that person wrong. Maybe they just, they're still working there at nearly 70 now and loving it. Yeah. 
but I would wager that most people would want to be thinking about hanging up their boots by the time they're 55 to 60 and have a plan, even if they've run their business for a very long time, as to how that, how that journey comes to a close. Yeah, get it. All, all of this, to me, boils down to, in, in terms of your role within that process, is how much people trust you to support them. Yeah. If they believe that you're going to be that reassuring, consistent voice that's calm, then they're going to engage with you. And I think your emotional intelligence through that process is, is critical. Yeah. At one, building trust, and two, showing evidence that you can, you can really bring that emotional self-awareness yeah. and regulation to, to those many interactions I expect you have with people that are pre-sale and going through that journey. So well done to you, mate. Thank you. Um, it's, it's great. So when I'm looking to sell, <laughs> not yet. We've got, we've got a big I'll mission on our hand. Card. Yeah, we've got a massive mission on our hand. But I do ask you because, you know, I think what happens is when, you, when you're in your 30s, you might even do this, you know, younger than this, but I certainly do this. When you're in your 30s, all you think about is just living and probably when you get to your 40s, what's it going to be like? Because 30 to 40 feels like a big move. And then when you get your 40s, you don't think of your 50s, you think of your 60s. Yeah. So you jump a yeah, decade yeah, yeah. and you go, well, what does retirement look like? And then you go, well, yeah, what, what is my house going to be worth? What type of pension am I going to have? And is this business actually going to generate any revenue for me, even if I don't want to work within it? So I get it. And, and, and there are stages of, of the consideration around whether to sell your business or not. And, and for me, it's not, you know, when do we sell it? How do we sell it? Is how do we build most most value in this? Yeah. Uh, as well as have the biggest impact. And as like like you said, growth, growth, growth. You know, you can't slow down. And and especially at the moment where it's tricky to get people signing the dotted line, I think your emotional intelligence plays a massive part in building trust with the right audience in order to get more growth. Right? Sales yeah. being part of that mix. If you can't sell, then you can't grow. And I think a lot of agency owners. Um, can struggle with that part, right? Putting themselves out there. They're a service-based business. They're selling the skills of their people. So by the very nature of that, you need to showcase your people and present the leadership team. They need to be presenting the vision. But, you know, quite often that's hard. That's a challenge for us. But I think with good EQ, we can do that. And we yeah. can do it in a way that feels authentic, that really builds trust with our potential prospects. Well, taking the point of my, my client there who's had his leadership team leaving because there was no succession plan or, or vision. I mean, that's one of the key things, probably why, I mean, what's the number one reason people leave their roles? They, they don't like their manager. Yeah. That's the number one reason, but often it's, there's no vision. Where's the business going? You know, people are ambitious. They want to get on and they'll stay somewhere if that business is growing. Like if there's new clients coming in and new colleagues coming in who've got talent, you know, the opportunity to work with, you know, bigger brands is, okay, well, that's growth. You know, that's a reason to, to keep people. But if the vision hasn't been set and people aren't on board with the vision and, you know, and there's no plan for growth, then, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with this, but you could end up with a team of people who just want to come in and do a nine to five, you know, and that's, that's okay for some people. But I think most people... You know, who, certainly my audience that I work with want people who are A players coming to business. Yeah. who want to crack on and, you know, go on a journey. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's, that's, that's important. I love that. A players, you want people on the boat, don't you, rowing in the same direction. I think it was Daryl Scott that mentioned, you know, it's not, it's not just about culture or nice things that drives performance. It's being inspired not only by the leaders, but everyone that you look around yep. uh, next to you. And, and if you can be inspired by other players, it's a bit like me on a football pitch. When I'm playing for a team that's not that great, then my standard slips, right? <laughs> I try to keep up. When I know I'm playing with people that are really, really good, I up my game. And yeah. I think that's a really important part, actually. It's an important part to note that if you've got people that have really high level of self-awareness, that take responsibility for their behaviour, guess what? It's infectious. Yeah. And so you've got a whole group of people taking responsibility for themselves and not blaming all of these potential issues on other things. You know, we've all been there, right? Where that one person thinks the whole world is, is, is against them. And we all go through troublesome times. I've had my personal issues, as you know. I know you've had your personal issues and overcome lots of health issues. You don't tell the world that, but you crack on and you still perform because that's what you do. That's your makeup, but yeah. you have evidence of, of doing that. And, and so, you know, hats off to you for, for being able to do that with 
you know, all of the challenges that you've had in the past. Um, I want to bring it to a close. I think we've had a great conversation on EQ. There's so much more we could talk about. What's next? It is getting dark. It is getting dark. <laughs> dark. It may may rain. We want this to be a summer special, yeah. not a winter Wait, it's, special. It's an English summer special. An English summer special. Bank holiday special. When was that filmed? Christmas. No, it was in August. Yeah. Um, what's next for Cactus and Agency Nomics? That's a, a great question. I think um, I spoke about you know setting a vision and growth. Um, as being quite important in, in business and you know Spencer and I put our monies put our money where our mouths are so we've set out a, a, a plan for the next five years in terms of growth um, we've mapped out I think at every half a million in revenue jump up what the team will look like we've got the hiring plan we know the order that those people need to come into the business I think as those people then join the business it's about okay well do we want to tackle the US maybe um, a bit more you know we're sort of working in Europe quite a lot at the moment um, done a lot of transactions with US based businesses and some of the people that we're attracting are A players well they're all A players that, we're, that are, we're attracted to Cactus but some of the conversations we're having with those people for us to have that vision brings more out of them someone in particular I won't say who they are they'll know if they watch this back though said to us through the interview process well I'd love to work in the US at some point. And we were like, oh, I'm so pleased you've mentioned that because that's something that's very much in our plans. So if you, if we see then your career looking a bit like this, you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter three being the US um, part of that. So yeah, more 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 growth, um, you know, in some ways more of the same. I think, we, you know, we all enjoy what we do. Um, and, you know, it's also with agency economics, it's, the community it's good to be able to give a bit back so to, i think i should explain the difference a little bit between the two because sometimes please. it's a bit of a common misconception and that yes please agency nomics is um was the book idea there it is that spencer and i came up with we started if you've read it oh this would be boring to you because you've read it already in the book but we came up with the idea about seven or eight years ago that just we should write a book there's so many great stories and things to share and we had no time, but we would always had long car journeys. So we'd book in a call with someone, um, driving back down the M6 at six o'clock at night, and they would just say, Pete, talk to me about cash flow, talk to me about X, Y, Z. They'd just interview us over the phone and write it all up. Did that for about a year or so, went into a big Google Doc, and then for whatever reason, we, we forgot about it. And then it was about four or five years ago, we were like, did we start writing a book? Honestly, it's the honest truth. Found the book, finished it off, got it out there and it's been I'm still humble to say this I actually you know hate saying it but it's, it's been very very successful we get lots of good feedback even still now I had uh, a LinkedIn comment today saying just listen to this it's so amazing um, some real nuggets in there and there's probably three or four times a week that that that, that happens but during the the pandemic we wanted to find a way to help people um, because it, I think if you remember, it was everyone's in this together and everyone just mucks in, you know. And our way was to launch a community which was free for agency owners to join where they could help solve each other's other's problems. So from our perspective, there's two things. There's a Cactus, which is the consultancy and M&A advisory, and Agency Nomics is, you know, the way that Spencer and I give back to the, the agency community yeah. where people can go in there have peer-to-peer -peer conversations, uh, you know, founder-to-founder -founder conversations where they need answers to questions. Um, Spencer, myself, special guests, members of the Cactus team will hold webinars and podcasts in the community. Um, and I think we we want to do want to do more of that. Yeah, um, that's you know that's really important to us. Amazing. Couple of things. I've met some of your new people. And I remember thinking, wow, how did you get hold of these people? They're incredible. Well, so I'm really, really jealous <laughs> that you made those hires because honestly, on the walks that I've met them on, yep. just blown away. So some really special people. Um, some of them have already reached out to me, had some Zoom calls. So that's really exciting for you. So really congrats on your growth. Thank you. Um, it really seems to be an overnight thing from just you and uh, Spencer to now like 15 people. Um, I know that... Lots of people are really grateful for the work that you do in the agency community. Um, I know it's free to join. Um, 
So yeah, go and check it out. You can type in Agency Nomics on Google and I expect you can find it. Um, and then you've got a big event coming up in, in October. Yep, at the Ham Yard. Okay, just give us a bit of insight into that. Um, so, I mean, we've done this for four or five years now. We have a one big um, Agency Nomics event each year, which is, a, I would describe it as um, South by Southwest in a day. Lots of different talks from different agency leaders, agency owners, uh, experts, um last year we did a whole day on web3 the metaverse ai that kind of stuff this year when we thought about you know how difficult it's been over the last year or so in terms of the economy we wanted to get back to basics a little bit so for us it's a chance to you know bring on experts in key areas and say let's go back to basics on on finance you know there's a lot of things that agency owners should be doing right now from a just not battening down the hatches really makes it sound a bit scarier than it is but just ticking the basics off and it's the same with sales and lead generation and operational delivery and all of the key areas you know talent attraction where there are some basics that you can do to keep your agency in in the right place so when we thought about that as a, a title for the event I, you know it wasn't about coming up with something you know jumping on the next bandwagon if you like it was about saying well actually Let's just go back to what people should be doing and spend a day focusing on that. So there should be um, a lot of great content coming out of that day. So well worth checking it out. Brilliant. So they can go and find that on Agency Nomics on Eventbrite? Yeah, it's definitely on Eventbrite. Sure, it'll yeah. come up at some point. Yeah. Okay, get yourself a place. I know they're uh, selling, selling like hotcakes. Selling like hotcakes. Yeah. Um, but it's always a packed out event. I've been to them. Yeah. I've spoken at one. Uh, and so I know it's a great event. Um, but yeah, back to this book. I think this is a must have for many agency owners looking to yeah scale to the first five million beyond i'm really grateful to be featured in this book under the personal branding section for, so thank you for that because that was a big big thing for us to be invited to contribute to that section um i know that you've got an audio book now or audio version sorry yep. so you people can listen to it rather than having to read it. it's a really pragmatic practical guide on how to scale your agency and it covers everything so if you haven't got it go and get it I would think to add as well on the, the Audible um, version, two things to say. The first thing is that Spence and I have very tight diaries and we couldn't change the day we were recording it and we both had COVID and came out of it the same kind of week. So we both sound exactly the same, but we are two different people on there. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and um, the second thing is on the, on the audiobook version, we've done some bonus um, content at the end of each chapter. So there might be a story about, um, will be a chapter about new business, for example, and then we'll tell a relevant story at the end of it, which is quite a nice um, bonus feature. And I think also a little bit of fun for us as well, because, um, you know, when you've had COVID and you've had, you're sick of strep seals and lem sips and you need a, that was a bit of a pick me up. Sounds sad, but I really enjoyed doing that bit. So I hope it comes across if you, if you listen to that. Amazing. Well done. Well, look, we all need a bit more fun in our lives, don't we? You need to um, see the fun in everything. And I think you do that really well, uh, as well as, you know, focus and helping people to scale. Because, you know, when we get that growth, we can have a lot more fun, right? Yep. Things are a lot less stressful. So it's important that we have that growth mindset. Take the advice from the experts, the people that have been there and done it. Reach out if they need help. Join the community. Be surrounded by peers that are going through the same challenges and problems and take ownership for your own level of self-awareness and develop your EQ. So it's amazing to hear your EQ journey and obviously some Thank of you. your professional journey today. Um, from me, it's great to have you as a friend and an advisor, someone that's helped me personally on growth and look at those numbers specifically and make them fun because they're paramount to, to helping us grow as, a, as an organization and it allows me to get on with the stuff that I really enjoy doing. So appreciate you. For, for helping me with that and giving up your lovely space today in this garden. Look at that, and the sun's come out now. Brilliant. There you go. It's almost cans in Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you, Ryan, for that. I just really want to say thank you for a great conversation today. Coming up with the idea, we spoke about this a couple of um, weeks ago. It's been a fantastic conversation. And also thank you for sitting in the, the chair today and effectively doing my job for me so much easier being interviewed than it is being the interviewer i have to say so 
That was um, episode 78 of Agency Phonics. Just want to say thank you once again to our sponsors, Sante Health, who provide um, health and well-being solutions for um, businesses and their, and their teams. And also thank you to uh, Louisa, Abby, Louise and Dan, who work behind the scenes at Cactus and Agency Genomics to make all this stuff happen. Thank you.